so our aim is is um, as our shared world is to try and get people to think about um, the purpose of education uh, to bring together evidence and to bring together the practitioners um, which is a vast number and there are about 300 uh, at, at the moment on our database um, our purpose of these two sessions this one and then one either in April to be confirmed or it might be in May are about thinking about the journey the educational um, journey that would build green or sustainability skills but from early years, and we've got the um, amazing Leslie Adwin talking about the age range three to six early years, Richard Dunn talking about primary level, Peter Duncan, some of you may know him, who is a, a former Chief Scout and Blue Peter presenter, so uh, a range of uh, ages, but also that informal perspective. Charlotte Bonner, we just have some slides, but that's Effie, and um, Penny Hay from ba Dr. Penny Hay from Bathsfair University in the Forest of Imagination is going to talk about um, a very different approach to developing these green skills uh, along with Livia or Liv as she likes to be called. So um, if we could go to Leslie Adwin first. Um, okay, Leslie, um, this is the amazing fact I found out about her when we had a, a, a phone call. She was voted by the New York Times the number two most impactful woman of 2015. Um, second to Hillary Clinton. At this point, I think we should all bow down. Uh, she's been awarded various prizes, various prizes. I mean, too, too big to mention, really. Um, but she is fundamentally a former filmmaker. And she created a film called India's Daughter, which was took two and a half years to make. It's been critically acclaimed. It won awards. And it was recognised as sparking this global movement to end violence against women and girls. And because of the insights of this, that led to Leslie uh, beginning this charity called Think Equal. It's a global education in initiative. Uh, she's the executive chair. Uh, it's won loads of awards for the work it does. And specifically, it works on these early years in pro-social or pro-environmental behaviors. Um, and she has been in all sorts of other groups that are way beyond our shared world, like the Pope Francis Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, I think it was, was it the World Economic for, Forum? Was that one of them? No, actually not that one. It's uh, Mission 4.7. Mission 4.7 um, with Ban Ki-moon. With Ban Ki-moon, yeah. Yep, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So it sounds like uh, Leslie knows everyone, but has focused on this very important uh, three to six year old years um, and, and love to hear what you think about green skills, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for that um, really generous introduction, Anne. Um, the, the NGO that I founded um, is called Think Equal. And I mean, I guess in, in a time when, when we lurch violently from one crisis to another, um, in the midst of a, a mental health pandemic, a time of development and climate emergencies, one after the other, crisis levels of gender-based violence, systemic racism, it, it just seems to me that the need to rethink our current system of education has never been more critical and it's never been more urgent than right now. Um, and, and I believe with all my heart that the only way in which to tackle the problems that beset us is by tackling the mindset that leads to them. I think mindset change is the only answer. It's the only sustainable answer. And so this work that, that um, I, I lead with Think Equal is solution-based um, and, and it's an approach to these global societal issues that, that's centered on prevention and on long-term sustainability, creating a new generation of thinkers um, rather than a reactive response dealing with the symptoms of the disease. So Think Equals work essentially is framed by this question. How can we possibly deem it to be compulsory to teach our children numeracy and literacy, yet it's optional for them to learn how to value other human beings and the planet itself? 
And, and I believe this can't happen in some generalized curriculum in some EYFS framework with lists of outcomes and objectives and intentions. It can only really happen through the deployment of concrete programmatic tools and resources that have been designed for purpose. I'm going to zip through a few slides. The importance of early learning. Why do we focus only on the three to six year olds? It's because we believe that the foundation is critical. We do not in any shape or form give up on children above the age of six, but we know from neuroscience that the brain architecture formed prior to the age of six is foundational. It's when the brain up to the age of six is the most neuroplastic. That is the optimal window of modifiability in terms of attitudes and behaviors. We ignore those early years and that foundation at our peril. Education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. The key question is what kind of education? It sure as hell, I believe, is not the education of uh, that model of the Industrial Revolution, uh, which was, you know, the education leading to, to the labor market. Um, it's the education that teaches us to love, not to hate. The education that teaches us empathy. And here are the skills, the 25 um, competencies and skills that we teach in three age appropriate levels to our three to six year olds. Um, we're focusing here today on green skills, environmental awareness. Um, I, I followed a, a really important point um, and points actually in the chat that we really should widen out our, um, our, our, our thinking about what these green skills are uh, to more to pro-social um, skills because if we think of the, the, the communities and the think of the planet, those skills will be green, but they'll also be empathetic and they'll also be, um, you know, constructively uh, um, problem solving and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll just skim over that because we don't, we don't have time in, in these five minutes to go into too much detail, but in our program, the concept of environmental awareness is introduced as all our 25 competencies and skills are concretely, tangibly in stories. Narrative is so key um, in terms of you know, building that new collective narrative in that classroom um, that, that, is, that is green, that is pro-social, that is loving. Um, we have, this is just a quick skim through some of the materials we have, this particular book written by our founding patron, um, Sir Ken Robinson, who poured over our materials with me for three and a half years um, until he sadly left um, us all. Um, Loving Earth uh, is, is for level three, our five to six year olds. Um, here is a book, I Love My Planet, from level one for our three to four-year-olds. Tabo and the Trees, uh, which focuses on activism, actually, for our three to four-year-olds. And A Tiny Seed for our four to five-year-olds, the story of Wangari Matai in Kenya. Um, Brahman Sun is about the um, melting of the ice caps, uh, the best sort of magic. Um, it's really just inspiring stewardship of the planet and all of its creatures and the earth um, uh, speaks about um, uh, pollution and, and explains what that is and why it is so selfish and so uh, wrong of us to not be stewards of the earth. A Tale of Tomorrow, two brothers, um, one of whom cares deeply for uh, the environment and the other of whom is selfish and acquisitive and irresponsible. Um, these are just a few examples of the resources that we use with the children. We have to start early. We have to change mindset or I believe we will literally go round in circles. That's Thank it. you so much. That's really interesting. Thank you, Leslie. So I'd like to introduce Richard Dunn now. Um, now, Richard thinks he's known me forever. I don't think that is true because I'm much, much older than him. 
Um, so Richard is now director of Harmony Education, but I first met Richard when he was a head teacher in a school in Walton upon Thames that's been classified as outstanding. And it was one of the schools that I uh, really saw sustainability built through from early years all the way through um, as a primary school. Um, and those students did inquiry-based learning and a, a sort of a whole school approach. And when we launched the Sustainable Schools Alliance, he, um, he brought his students along and I think they were um, 10 years old and they explained sustainability better than I've ever heard any adult explain sustainability because for them, it was real world learning. That's what they were doing. Richard is now director of Harmony in Education. It's the Harmony Project, which is at the moment part of the Sustainable Food Trust, um, but is becoming its own charity. So Richard, give us the wisdom of your many years in education and building green skills. Thank you, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. And uh, thank you for referencing back to all those years as a head teacher and uh, in a primary school. I think just building on what Leslie has said, absolutely agree that, you know, if we can get this way of seeing the world, relating to the world and one another right at an early age, then it will absolutely stick with those children as they grow up. And I think coming to the point that Anne just made, if you've got seven years in a primary school and children year on year, term by term, week by week, are uh, exploring the important matters of their lives and, and the world that they live in and starting to articulate what matters to them, then by the time they're 11, let alone 21 or 31 or 41, they'll have a pretty strong vision of what they want to see as they grow up. So I'll just share with you a few slides which relate partly to that world as, as a head teacher in a school and um, just give you a sense of the seven skills that I've picked out and they're very resonant with what Leslie has just said. So yes, I'm now director of the Harmony Project, working with the Sustainable Food Trust and indeed working with the Eden Project. I'm delighted to see Sam Kendall here, although I note she says she has a virus, poor thing. So get better soon, Sam. So yes, I'll let me just share seven skills that I thought about last night and feel are really relevant to the discussion today and to a sustainable future. Coming to this point of inquiry, I think this skill of questioning, of asking great questions, of observing things, noticing, listening, uh, those two indigenous questions of what do I see and what is it telling me, really essential to get that, that challenge in there right at the start and, and to encourage young people to ask lots of great questions. Link to that, this idea of seeing the world as a system, seeing that everything is connected and joined up, that the actions we take or make and the choices we make have an impact. So let's look at the stories of the things that we buy or the things that we say or the things that we do in our lives and whether they have positive outcomes and consequences or negative ones. So looking at that whole systems view year on year and really starting to see how everything is connected. I'm really struck at the moment how there's a, a shift or a, an, an urgency to want to shift towards learning that is much more practically based. I think we're really good at this with early years, but I, we lose it as children get older. And yet it's so important for our young people to connect to the soil, to the land, to make things, to do things and apply their learning to the real world. So I, I saw someone the other day from the European Forestry Institute, and she said, the one thing I think children need to do now is learn how to grow. Every child, let's get them growing. The skill of collaboration, we judge and measure education very much on an individual basis, don't we? And yet we know that as we move forward, we've got to be able to work well together. Uh, this was a brilliant exercise using wooden skis and getting children to move one leg at a time. And of course, if they got it wrong, they would just collapse in a heap with lots of laughter. But when they got it right, it was really interesting how, how quickly they were able to move forward. So yeah, skills of collaboration, essential for a sustainable way of working. This is an expedition on new leaders in sustainability. And these individual children were looking out on the Chamonix Valley in the Alps 
and thinking about what kind of future that valley needed to be sustainable, looking at it through different strands and then sharing their individual ideas with a team and then presenting in the best classroom in the world up in the mountains, what do they think the future could be like? We do a lot of work in education looking backwards and we need to balance that with looking forwards now. Where are we going? What's important? We've heard already about the skills of empathy, of care, of values, and we've got people here today from values-based education. And we know that when our children can understand the values that are important to them and then live them out and share them with each other and love each other and love the world, then we'll be in a good place. And the final one, I think this is your slide, Anne, that you were talking about, or one very similar. This is year six children presenting actually the House, House of Commons uh, on their vision for the future of their world. So giving them a voice, giving them leadership, uh, giving them opportunities to present their, their vision, their ideas in compelling ways. So that's what we're promoting through the work of the Harmony Project and really wanting to see how those skills can be applied through inquiry-based learning. Thank you. Fantastic. That's fantastic, Richard. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, there is a Harmony Project book, um, which I bought. Um, and you know, for every any primary school that does it, there's you can go from early years up to year six, and there are examples of the things that you can do. So it's a full curriculum, which is absolutely fantastic for those who uh, are new to this field and not sure not uh, sure how to start. Thank so. You. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to Peter Duncan. Um, Peter, for those of you who probably know this, um, is an actor, a presenter, a documentary maker, a self-confessed adventurer, a pantomime dame, a one-time Blue Peter man, and more, more, most importantly, former chief scout, which is how I met him uh, many years ago in about 2005 or 2006. Um, and he was awarded a, a much coveted gold Blue Peter badge for his work um, with the scouts of, of uh, was it half a million scouts or? Round <laughs> Sorry? Round about that, yeah. Around about that, okay. Um, and apparently he says that once a scout, always a scout, ready for anything. Um, if there's one person who might have an insight into green skills, it's, it's probably going to be Peter. But there's a quote I wanted to... Um, uh, say from him, it says, on election to the position of UK's chief scout, this is what he said, scouting is alive and well in 21st century Britain. Getting involved in scouting as an adult is about having fun and adventure mixed in with a real sense of purpose. Being a leader gives people the chance to contribute to the positive development of tomorrow's adults. So let's explore those green <laughs> skills a bit more, Peter. Do you remember saying that? No, nope. <laughs> not really. I think someone might have written that for me. I'm not quite sure. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> no, I do remember saying that. Yes, because I read it a lot. No, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I, I have to say it's uh, it's it's. I'm scribbling stuff down as people are speaking because it, it's uh, rather lovely to be surrounded by a. Uh, true experts in this field. Um, um, I suppose my role has always been very much that of a, a communicator of other people's ideas, certainly um, in my Blue Peter days. And, and even before I was a Blue Peter presenter, I was, uh, I suppose I was very green. I was saw myself, I was part of uh, things like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace. And I even think I even joined the, the Green Party before my Blue Peter days. But uh, on, 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 when I was on Blue Peter, I, I very much remembering it was the, the time where you were first sort of thinking about green issues they were always coming up but often showing young people who had ideas who were changing things and again I think it was often about observation and then by chance when I became um, chief scout and the, and the chief scout thing was an odd thing because um, at the beginning of this uh, uh, century I'd gone on these uh, made all these documentary films about taking my uh, kids around the world really again to observe it we, we you know backpacked around the world and backpacked through China and backpacked through India and and so much of wanting to do that was to observe 
the world um, and and to and so that they could observe it firsthand and that's how I ended up being chief scout because um, they wanted somebody who seemed to um, know what they were talking about but it, it, I think it was it, for me it's always been absolutely fascinating seeing the world through children's eyes and their their natural way of doing it. And, and I think the first two speakers uh, Leslie and Richard were, were, are extraordinary about their knowledge about this this territory and very much involved in in the views of Ken Robinson which is really I don't want to knock education, but in some ways it's almost anti-education because, because of the strictures of education, you're kind of stuck into the way we observe things and quantifying it. And, and of course, it's the simple idea of observation and seeing things, how things change. And I'll just talk about one, one event that happened in my life was making very early uh, um, uh, uh, sort of, um, what do you call it? rubbish TV? What's it called? <laughs> what do you do? You do think. Anyway, this is a TV program about literally driving around the world. We did it in the, in the mid nineties. And it was, it, it's, it's the first time it really affected me of understanding um, how the world was changing through observation. So we literally drove around the world through the channel done across Europe, right across Siberia, up the Kolomar river into the Arctic circle. And it was the point at which we got to that, that place where the tree line stops and the trees get smaller quite in a short space of time and, and suddenly you're on this kind of icy icy tundra and I really at that point really understood how how the world was changing because on this big journey literally around the world back through Alaska across Canada to New York uh, everybody was talking about how the world everyone we met on this journey was talking about how the world was changing and how quickly it was changing and how it was uh, affecting their lives so that's when I really got slightly um, uh, passionate about the subject and and um, and always wanted to communicate and be involved with young people and particularly people like Greta who've inspired young people. I think young people have been at it all the time, really. It's just that it's it's there much now and they're much more, they're seen as the activists. They're the people that are kind of kicking off and making uh, the older generation uh, perhaps feeling guilty about their past behavior. And, and as our first speaker said, you know, we're in this kind of maelstrom of events in our life with COVID and future wars and what's going to happen to us all. And it kind of pushes the environmental issues and skills into second place because a lot of people just having to deal with the, the changes in their lives and the change of power. You know, so much stuff is going on. It's very hard. But I was really fascinated what both said about early life, that when, when you're very young and you're seeing things and how that affects you. And, and, and I think that's really important. I won't prattle on, I've got loads of things I could mention, but I won't, but I really, <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. What was my latest contribution? Well, I suppose my latest contribution uh, to end on a joke was that I did produce a couple of years ago in the beginning of the pandemic, a, a planet saving pantomime, as I called it. And I got a lot of stick being very woke for doing this, but I had this kind of gas gazumping giant and a, and a kind of revolutionary jack who was climbing the beanstalk to get rid of the giant. Um, but the biggest problem was Buttercup the cow, who had a lot of bit of bit of a methane problem. So um, that's where that's that's my last. Uh, I don't know if that was practical, but I, why I've mentioned that is because I think it's uh, Leslie. Or, but they both mentioned it. I think narrative has the best impact on telling people. If you tell somebody a story and you tell a young person a, a story, and that in a narrative and you have a, a kind of a the end of the story where you go oh that's what it is that's the story I'm telling you and I think that is the most powerful impact because we can all be very as clever as we can and say all the things we must and must mustn't do but with young people you've got to engage them and you've got to tell them the story. Thank you so much Peter thank you um, I remember when you came and did this one of the seed sustainable schools conferences and uh you were a keynote, but people wanted to hear your stories for much longer. So I, maybe we can invite you back at some point to, uh, to tell some of the stories. Thank you. So continuing the unusual journey through life from early years, primary, um, we've skipped secondary. We'll come back to that in, a, in, a, in part two. Uh, FE, um, we're now going to go to higher education, but in a different way. So we're going to um, uh, have, a, have a quick session with, um, Penny Hay, who's Dr. Penny Hay from Bath Spa University. She's a research yes. fellow in the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries, a reader in creative teaching and learning and senior lecturer in arts um, education, school of education at Bath Spa. I first met Penny again many years ago. She thinks we've known us and each other forever. We haven't really, we haven't. It's been about the mid 2000s, I think. 
um, when we tried to find some ways to work together because I was absolutely fascinated by her um, continuing this idea about narrative and creative ways of engaging people in a quite a difficult topic. Um, she's followed by Liv um, and hopefully Jenny will introduce Liv. Um, so Penny, would you please tell us a little bit about your um, HE, intercultural, intergenerational, creative work? Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take sort of three minutes and then I'll hand over to Liv as well. So Liv and I are working together as part of the Rabbit Holes Collective. Tell you about that in a minute. So I'm just going to use a project um, as an example, really. So Forest of Imagination is a project now in its ninth year that's co-designed with Andrew Grant, who's famous for um, the super trees in Singapore. Our charity that's called House of Imagination now in memory of Sir Ken Robinson, who was our patron of 20 years, and Barspar University, and working alongside the local community and, and um, usually about 20 schools a year. So it's an intergenerational project, as Anne said, but today I'm going to focus on a kind of, I don't like the term green skills, but um, we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in a conversation. I think it's much more about the focus on sustainability. So Forest of Imagination is a metaphor. It's a conversation about the importance of nature and our collective imagination. It shines a light on the importance of global forests and green skills in this context, real world learning, I like that, to develop ways of living more sustainably together. So skills for a fairer, greener future to take hopeful action. Next slide, please. Social, environmental and racial justice is very much at the heart of our work. So thinking about sustainable thinking and action together, hopeful action, I think Rich said in the chat, skills for green transformation. So what I would like to do is to show you a short film where together we are learning um, with children and young people uh, for and with nature, so observing noticing, feeling, choosing, inquiring, acting, all in social connection. And in this film, you'll see we're inviting children to be part of a living classroom, the living tree, as stewards of the environment. So, um, yes, let's see some evidence of this in the film. Importantly, we're looking at imagination and creativity at the heart of this process. So agency of young people, well-being, shared compassionate values, hopeful action, as I said, envisioning change and achieving transformation. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
just to end then, I think, you know, my invitation is for young people as climate activists, no matter how gentle, I think it's absolutely important as a collective, we have a powerful movement for these hopeful futures and future generations. So on that note, uh, we are the system, Liv, we are the forest, over to you. So my name is Livia Filotico, um, and I am working with Penny on a, an artistic and research project. And I'm here today uh, representing Shimaka a project I'm involved in as a researcher and as an artist. Shimaka is an education project I'm developing with the Sakura Nation of Ecuador, a nationality of about 550 people living in the Amazon forest uh, on the upper border uh, between Ecuador and Peru. And we are together translating the messages of the forest, of the Amazon forest, in a pedagogic framework and a curriculum to then pass on to children, young people, university students, and then pretty much everybody who's interested in learning these skills, um, pass them on, basically. Uh, in terms of skills, again, I'm with Penny, not so sure about the word skills, but um, there are so many, and they come from the forest. That is the key concept. Uh, rather than talking to you about what skills we're trying to develop, um, I want to to just leave you with this message that the skills are not something we produce or something we create and then pass on, rather is something that we listen to. So the skills are already embedded in what we call the natural world. They're embedded in, in the forest, which is us. I'm forest, you're forest, everyone is forest. And learning how to, remembering how to listen to those skills is, the skill number one, the first one we have to focus on. If you're interested about the project, it's called Shimaka. Thank you. Thank you, Liv. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you to our speakers in particular.